The scripture for today is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may, filled, you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you remember last week, the Apostle Paul reminded us uh, by reminding the ancient Corinthians that to the Jewish ears, a crucified Messiah was a stumbling block, really a scandal, and very difficult for them to believe. And that to the Gentile, or, you know, the Roman world ears, a crucified leader or a crucified Savior, uh, the idea of a crucified Son of God was just complete foolishness. Nevertheless, it was the church's proclamation, right? The church continued to proclaim God's love for the world embodied in Jesus Christ, in particular, God's love for the world in that fleshly body of Jesus that was on the cross. Paul mentions that in the reading you heard in Colossians, this fleshly body of this man, this Messiah, this Savior that God reconciled the world to himself through this man. 
Also in Colossians 1, Paul sets a description of Jesus before us that invites us to consider the man on a cross, Jesus on the cross, in in a big way. If you do want to take hold of your scripture, we are going to look a few times at verses 15 through 20 and what Paul says there in Colossians. He invites us to consider the man on the cross, Jesus, as the image of the invisible God, the one through whom all things were created, the one in whom all things hold together, the head of the church, a a man in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and a man in whom and through whom God made peace by the blood of his cross. Now, I just want to slow down for just a moment with that text and listen to what it is we, the people of Jesus, say about Jesus, what we proclaim about this man, that he is the image of the invisible God. Not like us, not not we who have the image of God in us, right? We who are created in the image of God. Paul says here, Jesus is the very image of God, including the image on the cross. That Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, which is a Hebrew way of saying that prior to creation, Jesus had already been, which we now talk about sort of an eternal nature in relationship to who Jesus is. Paul says all of creation, every bit of it was created through him, through Jesus. Now, this is the emphasis upon the idea that in Genesis, when God spoke, the word said, let there be light. And later, the Gospel of John talks about Jesus as the word who was with God in the beginning, the word who was God, and that word who took upon flesh being Jesus. Paul here speaks about Jesus as this agent of creation, that all of creation, everything visible, invisible, thrones, whatever it is, you name it, has come through Jesus. He says Jesus is before all things, which we've already emphasized in the firstborn of creation. But then he says, in Jesus, all things hold together. In Jesus, all things, everything in creation, everything that you can think of, not think of, see, not see, everything holds together in Jesus. Paul says Jesus is the head of the church, which that seems like the easiest phrase in this whole paragraph makes sense to us that Jesus is the head of the church. But then he also says Jesus is to have first place in everything. And by first place, he doesn't mean blue ribbon, gold medal kind of first place, like Jesus has won a race against somebody else. It's the more the idea of preeminence, it's superiority. It's that Jesus is in everything, right? That there's nothing greater. It's the idea of a name above every name, the King of King, the Lord of Lords, that kind of notion that in Jesus... There is nobody who stands in front of him. First place in everything. In verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. I I, I don't know how to emphasize, you know, the weight of that sentence, right? Because what can contain all the fullness of God except God? And yet Paul here says all the fullness of God is contained in that man, in his fleshly body, in Jesus. And that God reconciled everything. Paul uses everything multiple times in this paragraph. Everything. That's all of creation, all of humanity, all of history, everything you want to name. God has reconciled everything through Jesus, and in particular, through Jesus on the cross. So Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20, friends, is a big, weighty claim about Jesus. And I want you just for a second, if you try to put yourself in the shoes of these Colossians who are hearing this read to them for the first time, or you try to put yourself in the shoes of the ancient Corinthians or Ephesians or Philip, any of them, right, that Paul wrote to, hearing these words about Jesus, can you understand that as they hear these things, how the rest of the world thought it was foolishness? Foolishness. 
to make that kind of claim about a man who was killed on a cross. Now granted, like we said last week, the resurrection, resurrection made an enormous difference on how that claim of Jesus' death began to enter into the world. But you can get a sense of what Paul is saying here and just the grand nature of Jesus Christ and how those around the folks who were embracing Christ thought them foolish, thought them mad. How can Paul say all this? How can Paul look you know, at the, the grand, you know, grandiosity or the glory, the strength, the power of the Roman Empire and claim this about Jesus whom the Roman Empire put on a cross? How can Paul make this claim about this man, Jesus? Well, it certainly matters who is on the cross, right? I mean, it matters that it is Jesus that was on the cross. I want to shift from Colossians to a story in the Gospel of Luke. And you, you may know this story. Uh, some of you, if not, it's fine. But if you may remember in Luke chapter 23, when Jesus is crucified, that he's crucified with two criminals, right? One criminal on his right, another criminal on the left. And Luke tells us a little bit, just a short paragraph, but, you know, we can play with our sanctified imaginations and think a little bit about that, that story of Jesus in the middle between two criminals. And we know that one of the criminals responded to Jesus with a, a great deal of anger, sort of gave him a piece of his mind. Uh, you remember one of the criminals said, aren't you the Messiah? Aren't you the anointed one of God? with all the power and all the privilege and all the wonder that should come with that. Save yourself. Save us, he said. Do something, O oh great anointed one. Now this criminal here in his pain and his anger and all the torment that is the Roman cross lashed out at Jesus. It doesn't seem like he believes Jesus is the Messiah, or he might have hoped for it, but even his hope for Jesus being the Messiah is only in relationship to getting him out of his predicament, right? He may hope that Jesus is the Messiah because he'd really like to get off the cross. Save yourself, and by the way, save us too. Well, the other criminals seem to respond differently to Jesus. Now, you may remember that story, right? The other criminal begins by shutting down the angry one, right? Who do you think you are? <laughs> we, you and I are on these crosses because we've lived lives that brought us here, right? We made decisions that put us on the cross. And then he points to Jesus, says, but him, he's done nothing wrong. Now, I don't know what this other criminal knew about Jesus. Luke doesn't tell us. Luke doesn't tell us whether this other criminal, when he says he does not, did nothing wrong, Luke doesn't tell us that this other criminal knew that Jesus had healed lepers. He doesn't he didn't tell us if he knew that Jesus had you know, fed 5,000 plus with just a few loaves of bread and fish. He doesn't tell us if he knew about Jesus raising a widow's son from death and giving her son back to him. He doesn't, he doesn't tell us if Jesus knew how Jesus sort of shut the mouths of the pompous religious leaders of the day. We don't know how much he knew when he said, this man has done nothing wrong. But apparently he knew enough to appeal to Jesus in that moment as Messiah, as King. And that's why he asked Jesus that famous question, right? Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? That's what the criminal asked Jesus on the cross. Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And that sentence is a recognition of Jesus as, as Messiah there on the cross, one who can remember him. Now, by remember him, the criminal doesn't mean Jesus, like, will you take a quick photographic picture in your mind and will you have a memory of me and, and what we're doing here on the cross? This is not about will you remember me like I remember something that happened in the past. This is more a re, if you put a re and then a dash and a member, this is more, will you remake me? Will you reconstitute my life when you come in your kingdom? The reason he's asking that is because this criminal is about to die, right? His life's about to be over. 
So as I die here on this cross, Jesus, can you remake me? Can you reconstitute me when you come in your kingdom? When all of death is defeated in your kingdom, right? When you make everything right in your kingdom, can you remake me? And all the bad that I did, all the things that put him on the cross, he deserved to be on the cross, can you redo me? That's what he's asking in that remembering. When you come in your kingdom. This criminal, again, is about to die and his appeal to Jesus. I think his appeal to Jesus is what you see in Colossians 1, 13 and 14. If you're looking there at the text, verses 13 and 14, I'd like to put Paul's words into the mouth of that criminal. Because I think what that criminal is asking, Jesus, will you remember me and will you rescue me from the power of darkness? Will you transfer me from the power of darkness into the kingdom that you are setting up? Will you transfer me to your kingdom? Will you do that by your redeeming love? Redeeming, redemption is also a kind of reconstitution, remaking us from captivity into freedom. Will you redeem me and will you forgive me of my sins? That's what the criminal, I think, is asking. What Paul emphasizes there in those verses. See, the the criminal asked this of Jesus not only because Jesus had done nothing wrong. He asked this of Jesus because he believed Whatever it is he knew, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the one who could do that, remember him, remake him, reconstitute him, the one that could invite him into his kingdom. So the man beside him on his own cross for him was was the Savior. He was the Messiah. And in that Old Testament parlance, he was therefore the hoped-for king. So that criminal, right, it mattered who was on that cross, It mattered who was on that middle cross, not as a fellow criminal, not just as another victim of Rome's brutality, but that that man on the cross was the very image of God, that the one that this criminal needed to hold all things together, right? Everything in this criminal's life was coming apart. He needed one who could hold it all together. Could it be the other one on the cross, the Messiah, the one that would become the firstborn from the dead? He didn't know that yet, but the firstborn from the dead, the resurrection, the hope, that the one dying beside him was the fullness of God. The fullness of God that pleased to dwell in Jesus, the fullness of God that was in Jesus. Listen, even as Jesus was on the cross, the fullness of God is on the cross. The fullness of God is on the cross. The one with all the authority to make peace between this criminal and God by his sacrifice. And so in that Luke 23 story, do you remember Jesus' answer to the criminal? Truly, I tell you today. Now again, I want to put Paul's words into Jesus' mouth here, right? Jesus said, truly, today you have been rescued from the power of darkness. Truly, I tell you today, you have been transferred to the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you today, you have been redeemed. You have been forgiven. And then, of course, what Jesus says to the criminal is what? Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. In that Luke 23 story, in the story, it it matters who is on the cross. It mattered to that criminal, and I think it matters for all the ways we still talk about Jesus today. And what I mean by that is that we still say that the death of Jesus on the cross is redemptive. We still talk about the cross of Jesus Christ as redemptive, as something that makes a difference in the world, in people's lives, in the life of communities, in life of churches. We still talk about it as redemptive. We still say that Jesus' death on the cross, to borrow again Paul's words, rescues us, brings us into God's kingdom, redeems us from a captivity to sinful ways, destructive ways, forgives us of our sin, which is tied to being reconciled to God. 
forgives us of our sin, which is tied to being at peace with God because Jesus bore the weight of the world's hostility on his shoulders, on the cross, on his fleshly body, on the cross. He died with that hostility. And then, of course, we talk about he overcame that hostility in the resurrection. But I will freely admit to you that in 2024, in our world, be it the, the world at large or be it the place we actually walk around and drive around here in Durham, it is hard, as Paul says in verse 23 of Colossians 1, to continue securely established and steadfast in faith without shifting from the hope, hope promised by the gospel. It's hard to continue established in the faith. It's hard to continue steadfast in the faith. It's hard to keep going without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel. Because I think it's at times hard to hear something like the, the Russian Orthodox Church bless Putin's war in Ukraine. It's hard to hear church leaders look at what's happening in that arena and them to come back and say, oh, this must be God's work. This must be a good thing that is taking place, which is what some of the Russian lead, you know, church leaders have said about Vladimir Putin. It's hard to hold on to this faith when it's hard for us to even grapple with our own history, to grapple with our own history of, of people who used these stories, this text, to claim other people were not worthy of life. Other people were only partially human. Right? Maybe three-fifths of a human. It, it, it can be hard. I saw again this past week some of the images of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And it's hard for me to take in the name of Jesus and the image of the cross next to a makeshift gallows. It's hard for me to understand how someone who claims the name of Jesus can think those two things go together. Jesus' name gets attached to so much that is so unJesus like that it becomes hard to continue steadfast in the faith. It becomes hard to continue without wanting to shift away from the hope of the gospel if that's what the gospel means. I feel like I understand more and more why people walk away. And I understand more and more why I need to keep returning to the man on the cross. Why I need to keep returning to the very image of God on the cross. Why I need to keep returning to the fullness of God on the cross. Why I need to keep returning to this unlimited reconciliation and peace of God through Jesus Christ on the cross. So when I hear the name of Jesus attached to something unchristlike, I need to return to the one on the cross. Right? When I see an image proposed to be Christian attached to something that is obviously not Christian, I need to return to Jesus on the cross. You know, if we're going to embrace Christ the center, then we will need to keep embracing and re-embracing Christ on the cross. We will need to keep embracing and re-embracing Christ on the cross. So you know I borrowed that phrase, Christ the center, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor and theologian, especially prominent during World War II, I want to read a portion of a sermon he preached in 1932 in Berlin as the Nazi regime was really beginning to gain traction in the midst of, of that country. So Bonhoeffer wrote this, the wondrous theme of the Bible that frightens so many people is that the only visible sign of God in the world is the cross. Christ is not carried away from earth to heaven in glory but he must go to the cross. And precisely there where the cross stands, the resurrection is near. 
Even there, where everyone begins to doubt God, where everyone despairs of God's power, there God is whole. There Christ is active and near. Where it is on a razor's edge, whether one becomes faithless or remains loyal, there God is, and there Christ is. If I could be anyone else other than myself this morning, I'd like to be that criminal on the cross beside Jesus. Now, I'd like to be that without all the pain and the torment um, of the cross, but you know what I mean, right? I'd like to get a greater sense of that criminal's view of Jesus. What compelled him to ask Jesus, will you remember me as you come into your kingdom? For him in that moment, Everything in his life, everything in his world depended on who that man was on the cross. And I think for us today in this moment, it still matters who it was, who it is that was on the cross. Will you join me as we pray? Father, remind us again through the words of Paul, this big, weighty explanation of who Jesus is, that it is in Jesus where our faith rests. It's not in anything else. God, it, it's not in the strength of our convictions or the strength of what we do or don't do. It is in what you have done through Jesus on the cross. God, remind us, again, just through the the imagery of of a criminal appealing to that man, that Jesus on the cross, that it's not that different from our own appeal. Jesus, will you remember us? And not just in a memory way, but will you remake us? Will you reconstitute our lives by the grace of your kingdom? So, God, we pray yet again this morning that we would keep Christ the center but we pray more specifically that you would help us keep the cross central to what it means to understand your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this humbly in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, when I invite you to a response, you know, I've, we're in a Baptist church. We have some Baptist convictions and distinctions and all that, but I don't really invite you to come and be a Baptist. I want you to come and be a Christ follower in the invitation. Because it wasn't Jesus the Baptist dying on the cross, right? It was Jesus the Son of God dying on the cross. Christ the center. Christ the fullness of God. The fullness of God on the cross.